If you and I know the way, why aren't we guiding people the way, the truth, and the way that they can have life and have it in abundance? Are we attracted to Jesus because of what and who He is? Accomplished to draw man back into ourselves, to draw them out of the hands of the enemy, to bring them back to your glory. Is there any other way? Welcome to Wednesday night service at Majesty Worship Center. So happy that you guys uh, are here with us, you know. Amen. And uh, we're, we're even happier that uh, Pastor Alfonso and Batista are actually back. Praise God for that. That uh, you know that they had the ability to to leave and and actually allow the Lord to to refresh them and restore them and and yeah. and re-strengthen them. You know, we all need that uh, that refreshing sometimes. You know, it's. Uh, Sometimes our, our not just our not 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 do we just get physically tired, but but your your spirit gets tired too, and we have to allow the Holy Spirit to to rejuvenate us and to refresh us, and so when we're back and we're ready to go forth and and just keep, continue in the ministry, so Hallelujah. praise God that they're back and and Mom and all, you know it it, it it it's strange to like to be up here and like not see you guys. You know, so so it's awesome. It's awesome. I'm glad. I'm so happy you guys are back. Amen. So again, welcome, Majesty Worship Center, to everyone here tonight, everyone that's going to be watching online, and everyone going to watch in the future. You know, we welcome you. Um, last week, Pastor Alfonso had a, had texted me a screenshot of the calendar, and he's like. Wednesday is the last day of June. So this, so yeah. So last week I had told you guys, I was like, yeah, you know, Patricia will be up here and she'll be giving the message. No go, man. I just, one, one, one last, one last time. So amen for that. So we're going to continue in the, in the book of Acts. Um, we are... We're in Acts chapter 9. And like I was saying last week, when we started the, the recap from chapter 1 all the way through 8, chapter 9, there is, a, there is a complete change of everything here. Because now God, man, it, it, the power of God, the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit that can have the ability to change to change lives from the inside out. And what an amazing, amazing story and testimony that we're going to learn about tonight. So let's go ahead and open, open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come boldly. We come boldly to your throne by the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this day, Father. We thank you that you've allowed us and you've given us the privilege to breathe in, to breathe in the air that you provide, Father, your breath. We thank you, Father, that you're still on the throne. And no matter how many have tried to, to throw you off, Lord God, that you are just still mightier and greater than anything that can come up against you. So we thank you, Lord God. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. So we one day will have the ability to, to, to just take that inheritance that you laid out for us. I ask, Lord, that, that you cover us tonight, that you cover us with your blood that you shed from the top of our heads to the bottom of our feet, and you just give us a fresh anointing, a fresh anointing, Lord. We thank you so much. We thank you for, for all that you've given we thank you for all the provisions you've provided. But most of all, we thank you for your salvation and your redemption and your restoration in our lives. I pray, Father, that tonight, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you give us an understanding, you give us wisdom, and you give us discernment so we can understand these words, Lord God. So we can understand these words so it changes us from the inside out, just like you did, Paul. And I ask, Father, that 
You protect your word. You protect your word and you send forth warring angels if, if need be, Lord God, just to protect. But be on guard. We praise you. We worship you. We give you all the honor. We give you all the glory. We ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Wow. So, starting in chapter 9, the first part of Acts 9 is about the conversion of Saul. And what an amazing miracle, an amazing miracle that Jesus can perform. And, and like I was saying, man, to change someone from the inside out, to, to, to change their mindset, to change their heart, you know, physically, everything. And he has that power. He has that restoration power. And sometimes God meets us in a place where we don't even realize or understand that we need to be changed. And it was a change that was just so dramatic. A change that was so dramatic that, that it even changed his name. It changed his identity completely. So, Saul, Saul was, was the Hebrew name. It was the Hebrew name. Now later, we're going to learn in a few chapters from now, that God's going to change his name to Paul, which was his Greek name. And that's important because here you have this man who was the Jew of Jews. He was, he was a Pharisee. He was a man that was just so deep in, into the Jewish religion. And, and so by using his birth-given name of Saul, that was part of his identity, his Hebrew name. Now God, I don't know how he does it, but he foreordained Saul to become Paul, to use that Greek name so that he can identify with the Gentiles. And that's, kind of, that's kind of crazy to think about. You know, it really, truly is how God works like that. This man would end up writing 13 of the books in the New Testament. 13 books in the New Testament. This is where, because of this conversion, we get a lot of our Christian doctrine. What we believe. Why we believe it. Why we do the things that we do. We have the Pauline letters. We have all the things that he's done. I mean, and, and it's amazing. But, but we have to be very, very careful that we're not worshiping Paul. Unfortunately, a lot of people do that, and that actually has divided churches. Paul just like any, any one of us, any man, woman, who's professed their, their trust, who's professed their faith, their devotion, and their love, God can use every single one of us exactly how he used Paul. Paul was just a man that had faith. Paul was just a man that was obedient. And God used him in such a mighty, mighty way that changed and continues to change the world. In Galatians, in Galatians chapter 1, in verses 13 through 14, it says, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism. This is, this is Paul talking about himself. as He's reflecting back. How I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Now keep that in mind as we start going through this story. 
The last time we hear of Paul is in chapter 8, verse 3. And this is this was Saul who was going door to door to door and arresting and, and putting putting these men and women into jail because they were followers of Christ. You see, Paul had some anger issues. Just a little bit. You know, his, his anger, you know, consumed him because he was so self righteous in his own head that he w was thinking that he was doing what he was supposed to be doing. But Jesus changes all that. So if you open up your Bibles, Acts chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 1. And the word of the Lord says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were on the way, of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the man who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was there. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Verse 10. Now there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his, hands on, his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went, to, went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, immediately, there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Amen. In the beginning it says, 
than Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples. Like I was saying a while ago, he was just an angry, violent, violent man. And he was just absolutely convinced of his own righteousness. Just a self-righteous type of man. And Saul just plainly and flat out just hated the disciples. He hated anyone that would call on the name of Jesus. And later, again, you know, what's awesome about having those 13 books that he wrote is he did a lot of reflection. You see, there's power in memory. There's power in the memory of the mind. And it's a complete gift from God. Because you know what? We can remember the things that the Lord has brought us through. We can remember where we were when we had that conversion in our own lives. And then we have the ability later to use that as our testimony. Not only, not only to use it as our testimony, but to, to show, and it's like, no, really, this is, this is what I was like. This is what I was like. And so, in Philippians, in Philippians uh, chapter 3, Verses 5 through 6. Paul describes himself. He describes himself as he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteous, which is in the law, blameless. You see, he was a highly educated man. He was learning from the top rabbi, Gamaliel. And he was, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, which was... You know, you go back and you start reading about the different tribes. It was a noble tribe to be a part of. So he had the pedigree. He had, he had everything that it would take to be the Pharisee of Pharisees, the Hebrew of Hebrews. And sometimes what happens is when you have all that, that knowledge, when you have all the education, and you have all the, you know, sometimes... We get puffed up in our heads and in our hearts. And what ends up happening is, is, is we allow our egos and stuff like that to start taking over. And that's exactly what, what Paul did. Being self-righteous in his own mind and, and, and putting down the hammer on anyone who didn't believe the way he did. And it always, it always kind of freaks me out when, when you read about this kind of stuff. Jesus the Messiah was there with them. These were students from a young age of the Scriptures, and they still couldn't see that the Messiah was right there in front of them. He was a keeper of the law. He was a Roman citizen, so that gave him the freedom and the rights that every Roman citizen had. And he believed that Christianity was both wrong and that it was deceptive. He was so zealous, zealous I mean, just zealous. He just wanted to, he just had this, this fire inside of him that he went to the chief priest, and he's like, you know what? He goes, I know where they are. Give me permission to go get them, and I'll bring them back bound. I'll bring them back bound to Jerusalem. And I love how God always has a plan. He asked permission to go to Damascus to find and arrest the people of the way. The way.
the way. I actually really like that term. Because, you know what? What they tried to do, like when they first called the followers of Christ Christians, it was to mock them. It was like, okay, well, these are little Christs. These guys think they're little Christs, so they're Christians. And now they're calling them the way. And I like that because... Christianity, it's more than a term. Christianity, it, it's, it comes down to, to what we believe, what we follow, who we follow, why we follow. A lot of people think that doctrine doesn't matter. But without doctrine and understanding what you believe and why you believe it, you will lose your way. You will lose your way if you don't open up your Bible and read. Find out for yourself why it was called the way. It was called the way because it was completely different than anything else. Because they were following one man rather than a set of rules that God had given out. And in that one man, everything was perfect. In that one man, everything is perfect. And I like it also because we, we get involved in different things in our lives. Hobbies, our work, you know, stuff like that. And those things define us. We allow them to define us, who we are. But when it comes down to Christianity and the way, back then, everybody knew, oh, you're, you're part of the way. Oh, you're a Christ. Oh, okay. Now I see. That was, that was their identity. We lose our identity in the things of this world, whether it be our jobs or, honestly, anything that's going to take us away from the Word of God, anything that we can identify. I mean, we have to get back into that mentality of having our identity in Christ. You know, when we walk out of here, people should see something different about us. And I think it's, it's, it's pretty ironic that how you had Saul was being the persecutor of the church. And very soon, he was going to be the persecuted. And he would spend the rest of his life being persecuted. So it was from, from Jerusalem down to Damascus, it was about a six-day journey. It was about six days, you know, whether they're on foot, horse, you know, a lot of people say different things, but it was still a six-day six day journey. And the other cool thing is when we started going, you know, if you go back a couple of chapters, you go back to chapter 8, and, and again, we talk about about the Great Commission, we talk about how they scattered, and Paul, Saul, was a part of that. He was the one that made them scatter. And they started scattering so far off that they were down in Damascus now. And, and how, how crazy is, you know, how crazy is that to think about that? Like, he is the one that caused all this stuff, or helped cause all this stuff, and now he's going out to kind of try to right his wrongs. There was more than enough followers of Jesus in that far off place in Damascus that, that it was a concern. It was a concern for, for Saul. 
and he wanted to end it. You see, the word of God was starting to reach the ends of the world. Exactly, exactly how Jesus said it. And this one man would try to stop it. In verse, verses 3 to 4, it says, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He, Saul heard Jesus call his name. Twice. My kids know that if I called their name twice, it was serious. Like something was up. Something's going down. And I love how it says that, that the light shined. And it was shown. It was so bright. The radiance of Jesus, just by his voice, by his words, they're, they're brighter and more powerful than any light that the sun can produce. It's so much, so, so bright. That in heaven, there's no need for a son. Because in heaven, there is the son. And it was so powerful. What, is, what does Saul do? He falls. He falls down. Just says, this the power, the voice of the Lord just coming out. I think I would freak out. I would fall down straight on my face too if I heard the voice of the Lord calling my name twice. It's like, oh man, I thought I repented. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh man. You know, You know, to, 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 hear, to hear that power, to hear that authority, but also to hear that love. To hear the love in his voice and to hear the compassion. Like, Saul, Saul, like, like just, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? What did, what did I, what's your reason? That concern. And that's what Jesus does. He comes in all power and He comes in all authority. And He does it in a loving, compassionate way. His voice will bring the hardest most vile, wicked sinners down to their knees. There is no other that can do that. The conviction of sin that conviction of sin comes to our minds immediately. It's like uh, when you catch your kids doing something and they shouldn't be doing it. And you know in your head you shouldn't be doing it, but you do it anyway. It doesn't feel right. It just doesn't mesh with your spirit. And I thought about this. I was like, man, all of us persecute Jesus. 
every single one of us persecutes Jesus some way, somehow. He's like, oh no, not me. Not me. Persecute means to harass. It means to punish in a manner designed to injure. Whether it be emotionally, physically, spiritually. It means to grieve. Or to afflict. And to cause one to suffer because of belief. Who hasn't persecuted Jesus? That's, that's the question. We grieve Him. We grieve Him when we don't follow His words and His commands. We grieve Him. He puts it out there for us to follow. And sometimes we just do the exact opposite of what He tells us. Guilty. I'm so guilty of that. We punish him. We punish him when we don't get what we want. You ever think about that? We punish him when we don't get what we want. Lord, I've asked you this. I don't know how many times I've been praying for this. Well, you know what? I'm done with you. You can't produce. You can't give me what I... We're done. We punish Him. We abuse His grace. We abuse His love. And we abuse His mercy. And we afflict Him. And we cause pain when we do all these things. Knowing or unknowing. And the only thing we can do is Ask, ask, beg him to forgive us. When God repeats a name twice, it was it's like a display of like a deep emotion, like a concern, like Saul. You can hear the emotion in his voice when you read the passage. And just like any loving father will call out to his children when they're when they're disobeying, when they're when they're, you know, doing males that they're not supposed to be getting into. It's like, oh, I've told you already. Huh? But you can also feel the hurt. You can feel the hurt in his heart. You can feel the pain and you can feel the sorrow. When we get to that place in our walk with Jesus, when we start to get to know him, we start to understand the sins the sins that we do against Him, they grieve Him. <laughs> they grieve Him. Even though, even though Saul was going door to door to door and arresting Jews and, and putting them in jail, and he, he got special permission to go down to Damascus and, 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 and to gather even more. Even though he was putting these followers of Christ in jail, who was he persecuting? He was persecuting Jesus. He wasn't persecuting man. The Lord will take it personal. Once we come to Him, once we're part of His fold, 
You see, that's where the good shepherd comes in. He fights for you. He looks for you. When you stray off, he gets you back on that path. He will do everything to protect you. So here he is, and he's telling Saul, Why do you persecute me? See, this is such a this is such an important part of this scripture because I think we forget. Sometimes we get so self righteous in our own minds, and it's like, you know, no, I really don't have to do that. You know, no, I don't. God knows my heart. I don't need to repent. I don't need to fall flat on my face and ask for forgiveness for, for persecuting a holy God because He knows my heart. Man. You see, persecution, man, that's, um, like I said, we've all been guilty of it. And that's a hard thing to, to realize. But you know, when we do come to that realization, that's where God's grace and His love and His mercy come in. When we understand that, you know, we've abused it in the past. But you know, you'll come to a realization like, okay, Lord, Why? Why do we persecute? Why do we, why do we persecute Jesus? See, if we changed our mentality and started thinking in that way, we would live our lives differently. And that's what it's about, living our lives for the Lord. And what excuse? What excuse do we give when we know that we have sinned against God? Man, I, I can write a whole book of excuses. He believed, Saul believed that, that his, his actions were justified. That it was justified to, to, that it was okay. Because you know what? These people were going against my beliefs. These people were, 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 were making it more difficult for me to live. You see how that works? He was doing what he was taught. He was doing what he was taught and he was doing what he knew. You know, we are taught certain beliefs. We were made to follow certain traditions. And we did it because we thought it was the right thing to do. You see, every single one of us has had a Damascus Road encounter with the Lord somewhere, somehow. Maybe He didn't physically call your name but at some point, He's called you. He's called you out of the dark to bring you into His light. I love, I love what it says. He says, I am Jesus. I am Jesus. No other introduction. No, no, no other reason to, 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 you know, just, I'm Jesus. No smoke, no mirrors, no nothing. Because that's all we need to hear. That's all we need to hear. I'm Jesus. <laughs> if that name alone will make the demons tremble,
then why are we so stubborn to not allow it to penetrate our hearts? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Saul asks two of the most important questions that any human can ask the Lord. Who are you? And we have to ask that question with a humble heart. And we need to ask it directly to God. Who are you? Because, you know, a lot of us, even some of us that grew up in church, some of us that have been following the Lord for years, they don't know who God is. And why not? They neglect this. They neglect to read all the love letters so that God has so graciously given us. And so we don't know who He is. Paul spent the rest of his life wanting to know who God is. And every single place that he went, what did he preach? Christ. That's it. Period. That was his whole gospel message. Christ crucified. Who's God? Christ crucified. How do you get into heaven? Christ crucified. See how easy that is? We're just going to go out after here. We're just going to be like Christ crucified. We will never fully understand the fullness of God. Not, not, in, not when we're still in this world. But we have to purpose ourselves. We have to make it a part of our lives to continue, no matter the cost, no matter what's coming up against us, to continue to, to find out who God is. Because the more you want to know about Him, the more He'll let you know about Him. We have to make it our life's quest. Our life's quest, day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. And I can tell you, I can tell you from personal experience, the second I take my eyes off the Lord, bad things happen. Not cool things happen. It's like, that was stupid. Oh, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. Well, you know what? You took your eyes off the Lord a little bit too long. See, it's a quest. It's a continuation. And that's what Paul did. And that's how we learn from Paul. I mean, this dude went through so many crazy, crazy trials, crazy tribulations. But you know what? God had His hand on him. From this point... From when the first time he called his name, God had a purpose for this man called Saul. And he would continue, and he would grow him, and he would give him more and more faith. Christ crucified. Jesus tells Saul, it's hard to kick against the goads. Does anyone know what a goad is? What is it? So a goad, it was a long stick. 
a long, sharp stick. And it was used on ox. On an ox. Now, I'm not a rancher or anything like that, by, by no means. We can barely take care of our dog. <laughs> or me. But what they would do is, is, you know, they had an ox as a beast of burden. They would, they would, they would put plows to them and, and they would like get the fields ready to plant and things like that. And apparently, ox, oxen are not very smart. They would stop, or they wouldn't go fast enough, or they would try to turn. So, so, what, so what they would do is they would use this goad, and they would stick it in their hind leg to make them go. But what the ox would do, because he didn't know any better, he would kick back. He was being prodded to go forward, and he would kick back. And when he kicked back in his hind leg, it caused him more pain. We do that. We kick against the goads of Christ. He provokes us, and he tries to get our attention. And we kick back. And we kick back, and we fall down, and we fall deeper, and we fall deeper. Saul was the ox. <laughs> Jesus was the goad. He was poking him. Saul was stubborn and he was stuck in his own ways. He was that, that self righteous, that hard and cold heart. But you know what's awesome? As bad as Saul was, Jesus still had a use for him. Jesus still saw value in him. Jesus was still going to use him to glorify the Father in heaven. Jesus was going to use him to build the kingdom to the Gentiles. How crazy is that to think? We have to ask, we have to ask, we have to ask ourselves these two questions, right? Who is God? And the next one, what is it that you want me to do? What is it that you want from me? And no matter, no matter the fear that we have, no matter the doubt that comes into our heads, into our hearts, and that kind of, you know, stops us, we have, that's, those are the times that we take the promises of Jesus. We stuff those in our hearts and we, we continually remind ourselves, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm with you always. Even until the end. We have to get those things in our heads. We have to count on that promise that wherever we go, there He is. Jesus says, arise and go. Get up and go. I know you sinned against me. I know you persecuted my people. But I'm going to show you a new way. I'm going to give you a new life a new vision, and even a new name. Saul wasn't seeking Jesus, but Jesus was seeking Saul. And by grace, by grace, Paul found his new life in Jesus. But there was going to be a lot of pruning 
There was going to be a lot of pruning in, in Saul's life in order to get him to be a usable vessel. And that's the cool thing about Christ. He will take you step by step by step. He will take you from level to level to level. He will take you when you're when you're down in the pig's pen, like we learned last week, or we reviewed last last week, and he will clean you up. And he'll put a robe on you. He'll put a ring on you. And then he'll send you out. For his kingdom and for his glory. You know, Paul's very first step of being a follower of Christ was to be blind. His very first day of being part of the way was to be blind. Can you imagine that? Yes. You, you can follow me now, but I'm going to take this away from you. You believe in me now? Okay. Well, let's see how much you believe now. You see, and and Jesus took his sight. He didn't eat for three days. He didn't drink anything for three days, and he was blind for three days. Saul was learning to die to himself, and that's what God had to do in order for Saul to get this through his, I was going to say thick head, but it was probably a big head, to be like, you know what? There's none greater than me. And let me show you why. Blinded him. Three days. Three days in darkness. Who else was in darkness for three days? Jesus was in the tomb for three days, lifeless, in the dark, in the cold, in stillness. But what happened after the three days? Resurrected, full of life, and went out. You see the similarity? That has to happen to us sometimes. God has to completely blind us from the things of this world. He needs to pluck us out from where we're at and put us in another spot so He can do His work in us. But He's faithful. And He will do it. Can you imagine being blinded by the light that came from heaven and, and not being able to feel or not, not to see and, and you're having to feel around you and they have to take him by the hand and lead him. Now God God loves to use His people. God loves to use his, his followers, His faithful and true followers to bring others to Him. And He, he calls on Ananias. And He was a willing servant. And Jesus came to Him in a vision. And he obediently answered, Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. We say that we want to be used for the kingdom, but when the call comes, we're like, Oh man, is that today? Are you sure that was today? 
I'm kind of busy, you know, to go out and, and do what you're telling me to do. We have to learn that when, one, we have to learn how to be sensitive to, to, to the Lord's voice. Because sometimes it's not a slap in the face and be like, hey, you need to get up and go over here. Sometimes it's that, that small, still voice that we have to be learning how to listen to. Here I am. Lots of people, Isaiah, here I am, Lord. Use me. When we accept the call from God, what a blessing that is. Because, you know, when you know it's from the Lord, He will open every single door. He will put His holy hand upon you. And He will guide you step by step by step. He's a God of order. And that's exactly what He does with Ananias here. I want to point out something right quick, though. Is Paul or Saul. It's hard to call him Saul. You know what I mean? Because that's like the old man. We know Paul, the new man in Christ. So if I say Paul, you know, it's the same dude. In verse 11, Jesus is talking to Ananias, and he tells him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. Behold, he is praying. Even those that aren't true followers of Christ, They'll pray in their time of trouble. <clears throat> they will cry out to God in their times of, of sorrow, in their tribulations, in their hard times where they, they have nowhere else to turn. And they cry out to Him. They, they're praying to Him. It's like a natural thing in our hearts and our spirits to do. Atheists on their, die, on their deathbed will cry out. You know, people that, that have gone through traumatic experiences and, and they're like, Lord, everybody knows who Jesus is. But not everybody will accept Him as Lord. You see, Saul was, he was a religious man. He had been praying his whole life. But he never prayed in the name of Jesus. He didn't have that power and that authority. He just didn't know. So he did what he knew. He was praying, but he didn't pray. If that makes sense. He was calling out. But he didn't have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the Lord to, to, to be like, Lord, I need you. Lord, forgive me for what I did. I, you know, I'm sorry. You took my sight. If that's what you want for the rest of my life, then so be it. No, he was probably praying some, some Jewish prayer that he had been praying since he was a young kid. The repetitious, again, going back to the tradition and to the religions. You know. Being religious, I'm sure that Saul had said many of those prayers, but none of them were very heartfelt. And some of us that grew up in religious homes know exactly what I'm talking about. And in verse 12, it says, And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him, so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. 
He didn't refuse to go out and do God's will. But he did kind of question. It's like, are you sure, Lord, it's this dude? You, you know exactly what he's been doing to your people, right? You know, he's been, he's been jailing them and persecuting them and chasing them down. We'll try to justify why we won't do the things God tells us to do. And I love how Ananias didn't. He questioned. It's okay to question God sometimes. As long as you're doing it in the right way. And God called Saul a God called Saul a worthy vessel. And that's amazing to hear. Because if God can change the life of Saul and make him a new creation by the cleansing of the blood of Jesus, if he can do a heart transplant from stone to flesh, and if he could take this wretched sinner and make him righteous. then why do we deceive ourselves and think that he can't do that anymore? And what does a chosen vessel do? But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name, to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. When we take off the old man and we put on Christ, this is exactly how our life starts to transform. We bear his name. We bear his name. We become his ambassador. We become his representative. We, be, we become his voice, his, his, his hands, his legs. Or what? To go out and tell. I love, and it says here, but he's going to suffer. And he's going to suffer. And true followers of Christ, they understand this. But some, that's their point of like, uh, yeah, I'm done. I suffer enough. Man. Man. Saul continued to grow in strength. Ananias, everybody, everybody has had an Ananias in their lives. Someone to guide them. Someone to show them the way. Someone to, to tell them the truth of the gospel. Someone to correct them. Someone to, to go out there and just pour their, their everything into this person, this one person. Yes, Paul went out and he wrote 13 books of the New Testament. But if it wouldn't have been the, for the obedience of Ananias, there would have been no Paul. There wouldn't have been a Paul. And as soon as, as he put his hands on him and prayed, the scales, the scales of the dirty world, the scales of religion, the scales of self-righteousness, the scales of everything that is against God fell off. And now he was able to see with spiritual eyes. He was able to see. And, and, you know, it's like, it's like the song, you know, I once was blind, but now I can see. There's a lot of us walking around today still with those scales on our eyes. And we need to have that, 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 that come to Jesus meeting. We need to have him blind us from the things of this world so those scales can come off so we can see how he sees. I've asked him a couple of times. It's like, Lord, show, can you show me like the spiritual world? 
He hasn't yet. Well, not as much as, yeah. That's another story. But to see, to see things how he sees them, to see people how he sees people, to have the love and compassion that he has for everybody, but also to see what's righteous and what's not, but to also see what's clean and what's not, and what needs to be clean. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord. I'm going to close with this. Because we can go on forever on this. We can go on forever on this. You know, the message of, the message of Saul, it's all about Jesus. Everything in this book is about Jesus. Jesus knew that that Saul was he was going to be used. He was going to be used for the glory of God. Saul had just had an encounter with the Son of God, the Messiah that he had learned about his whole life. He memorized scriptures about the suffering servant about the coming Messiah, about the King of Kings, and, and all from such a young age. And now here he is face to face with him. And even though, as you continue to read the story, Saul had a zeal for the Lord now. Instead of having a zeal to persecute the Lord, now he had a zeal to serve Him because those scales had been taken off and because he was able to see spiritually now. And even though he was a persecutor, even though he was a grave sinner, and even though he had a bad reputation, God was still able to use him. You read the story. You keep reading. In this same chapter, as soon as he commits his life to the Lord, he gets persecuted. They try to kill him. And from this point on, Paul will continue to run the rest of his life from persecution. He will continue to run from, from death, but God preserved him because he was now faithful to the Lord. Allow the Lord to, to cleanse you. Allow him to, to take those scales off your eyes and ask him, ask him, ask him to show you. But when he calls you and you say, here I am, Lord, you better be ready to go. You better be ready to go. Amen. Like I said, we can be here all night just on this chapter. But you know what? God is good. His word is glorious. And it can be so deep and there's so much to it. And that's why we never stop learning about God. This is just one small speck. A small speck to looking into his kingdom. If you want, if you're up to the challenge, he will take you from level to level to level. But you have to want it. You can't be on milk your whole life and not grow. Amen. Ah. Heavenly Father, we just come before you again mightily to your throne by the by the name of your Son, Jesus, and the shed blood, by the shed blood that cleanses all of our iniquities, that takes those scales off of our eyes, Lord. We thank you for this night.
We thank you that your word is all authority and all power. Make it the authority and the power in our lives, Father. I pray, Lord, I pray that every word that was spoken tonight, that there was no offense to it, Lord. We've all had our solemn moments, and thank you, Father. Thank you for getting us through. Thank you for washing us and cleansing us and sending men and women to, to help disciple us and teach us your ways, Father. I ask, Lord God, that you just continue to, to, to put your, your hand on us and to guide us in all things, hide us under your wing. I ask, Father, that, that you just stay straight. Just as you had Paul walk on the road called straight, give us the ability to walk on the road straight as well. I pray, Father, that somehow, some way, you use us to build your kingdom, to glorify your name, and to bring other suffering sinners to you. I ask that as we go home tonight, Lord God, you get us home safely. I ask, Father, that as we put our heads down, that you restore us, Father. Restore us in our minds, in our hearts, in our bodies, but mostly in our spirits. I ask, Father, that you get us, you get us through the night and prepare us for the day to come if it be your will. And as we open up our eyes, Lord God, we give you praise and honor and glory for getting us through another one. We love you, Lord. We honor you. We ask all this expecting, expecting that you're already at work in our lives. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Glad that you tuned in. I pray and hope that the message that you just heard was a blessing to you. You know, the word of God comes in and transforms our lives from the inside out. What an amazing opportunity. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. Right now, if you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity right now, and I would be honored uh, to pray with you right now. If you've never given your life to Jesus, just repeat this prayer with me, and um, believe in with all of your heart. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that we will be saved. And the Bible also says that Everyone that calls out to the name of the Lord shall be saved. So right now, do you just repeat this prayer with me? Say, Heavenly Father, I choose to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that you raised him from the dead to give me new life. So now, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I turn away from, from my wicked way of living. I turn my heart to you. From this day forward, I want to serve you and I want to do everything that I can to be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer right now, I just want to welcome you into the kingdom of God, into his household. If you have a church I, or you don't have a home church, get plugged into your home church, wherever you may be. If you're in the Albuquerque, New Mexico area, we would love to have you uh, join us for worship here at Majesty Worship Center. Our address is as follows, 3250 Coors Boulevard, Northwest, Suite B. Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87121. We would love to meet you. We would love to, to fellowship with you. So I just pray that you would get plugged into the house of God. God bless you, and thank you for watching.